we're recording. Hey, I'm in the uh, Powell Finance Committee meeting of May 23, 2023, to order. And uh, the uh, meeting, I think we have a quorum present. And so I'm going to uh, make sure that everybody can hear and be heard. This meeting is being held via Zoom. Members of the public have access to the meeting um, through the Zoom program and through um, Amherst Media. Uh, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded. So um, going through members of the, to confirm that people can, members of the committee can fully participate. Let me know if you can hear me and we can hear you. Uh, Anna. I'm always first, and I was unprepared that time. I can hear you. Present. Uh, Lynn. Present. Bob. Present. Matt. Present. Bernie. Present. Kathy. Here. I think the only one we're waiting for is Alicia. Uh, who, in your keeping an eye, I see that Pam is here. I don't know if um, anyone else from the council is present who's not a member of the committee. This yeah, Jennifer here. Jennifer Tobb is here as well. Okay. It means we have six. So as soon as one more person, counselor arrives, we have a quorum. Okay. And then you'll check on uh, whether people can participate at that point. Uh, so the meeting order of the agenda today is, um, it's usual we're going to um, go into departments in a moment. Um, I don't see any members of the public present other than um, somebody I think is from one of the newspapers, but if there's any members of the public present who would like to offer public comment, uh, please let me know by raising hand. Seeing none, I'm going to uh, note that we did make the request and may ask again later if there are more people present, but uh, the first part of the meeting is to um, complete our presentation of budgets and, as usual, Sean has established, I assume, an order and uh, therefore takes over and uh, both uh, recognizes the order that we're proceeding and uh, has, says anything about prepared questions that he's received in advance. So, Sean? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so tonight we're finishing up the departments. Um, I spoke with Dave Zomek before the meeting. So the order we're going to go in um, <clears throat> is inspections first and then planning and then uh, conservation and sustainability. And then from there, we'll go to fire and EMS after that and then wrap up with public health. Um, so Dave and Rob, the format we've been using is just sort of going through the questions that were submitted. Um, so I'll I'll sort of run through the questions. I'll turn it over you to you after each question to give your response. Okay. Do you want to um, let uh, <laughs> Lindsay and Tim know that um, if they wanted to uh, come back in a little bit, that they can because we. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think they were aware of um, that okay. they were not the first agenda item, but Lindsay, Chief Nelson, yeah. you, if you guys yeah, want to, yeah, no problem. Listen in or or um, do whatever you'd like for probably about an, an hour. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll mute. You won't hear hear me eating the dinner. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the first question, is, Rob uh, and Dave, is for rentals and inspections. Sir, Kathy, do you have a question? No, Chris just had her hand up. I. Oh. Chris, you can eat too if you want. So I just wondered if you are not expecting any kind of presentation because you had said you wanted a three minute presentation from each of us. Yeah, we, you know, the format in the past has been that, but I think because we had sort of a compressed schedule with departments, we've sort of topped right into, um, right into questions. So I think, Chris, you know, any com prepared remarks you want to make, um, you can make them. I'll ask you the first question and then you can go ahead and just, you know, uh, incorporate what you'd like. Okay. Um, but first question so uh rentals and inspections are we assessing um the cost of ramping up inspections 
Um, what, you know, are we doing spot checks? Why not? Um, you know, is there a list of problem properties uh, related to health and safety, noise, overcrowding, et cetera? Uh, hi, everyone. Rob Moore, Building Commissioner. Uh, so the, ex the draft bylaw of the expanded program is currently uh, under review by the CRC and intended to be uh, uh, brought to the Finance Committee specifically to discuss the program costs and potential fees. So that's something that, you know, is ongoing and as recent as the CRC's last uh, meeting um, included a discussion on. Uh, the current program is complaint response only with one code enforcement officer, as everyone knows. Um, so there's, uh, you know, no kind of program for addressing problem properties or repeat violations, which is really kind of the, the reason why we years ago um, have been asking for this uh, bylaw amendment in part anyway to address that op or provide that opportunity. Rob, the um, the <clears throat> increase to, and this is your question, Andy, that you sent me earlier, the increase to the rental registration fees that happened um, I believe last year, um, did that, I can't remember, did that include any increase in staff um, responsibilities or was that just a straight increase to the fee levels? That that was a straight increase to the, to the fee levels. It came at a time when we were launching our new permitting program. So there was a, a significant amount of work, but it would have been needed anyway to transition mm -hmm. to our new OpenGov program. Uh, and that happened, the fees for the last renewal were connect, were collected under the new schedule. And, uh, you know, in about a couple of weeks, we start renewal again uh, under that same current fee schedule that was so, re revised last year. So to your question, Andy, um, there's nothing in this budget yet about increased um, staffing for the inspections department related to new responsibilities, um, because theoretically, those, or technically, those aren't um, in place yet. Um, if that bylaw uh, passes, then we'll have to revisit that. Um, but as of right now, there's no additional staffing um, related to that because that first fee increase that you asked about um, didn't include any additional staff requirements. Lynn? Basically, the, you just answered the questions that I had because if we're anticipating this, we can't put it in the budget if it's not passed. But right. we may have to come back to it based on whatever the implementation date is to it. Right, but exactly. I guess the other question, and this is, you know, I, I, if I start asking other questions, it would actually be going off script from what is the finance interest versus um, the interest in the vital. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. All right, so I will go to the next question. Um, Kathy, these are yours, right? Yes. The next one, the next one about feedback from small property owners. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I Rob, I just was wondering whether um, small owners, and by small, I mean um, I might have just one rental unit, it might be in my house or detached unit versus large multi unit. Do you get any feedback that it's easier or harder to work with you, depending on? And one crude way I'll do it is what I've heard is if you have clout <laughs> versus you're, you're the little guy. It, do, do, do you get, get any sense of that, you know, either on how often they're inspected or when they ask for something with a driveway or something with a porch? Um, uh, and these are all, I'm just focused on rental units right now. Yeah. And, yeah. Andy, before we proceed, um, Alicia's joined. And so you need to check to make sure she's she can hear us and vice versa and i need to call the council to order okay well alicia gonna... yes thank you andy okay um so back to you lynn because uh, um, uh, you not yeah, only given uh, that we have yeah given that we have a quorum of the council i'm calling the council to meeting to order at 5 40 and i would like to make sure that jennifer Tobb can hear us Jennifer's screen occasionally yes. seems you like, me? yes, we can. My screen's frozen. I'm going to, okay, Great. I'm going to re-sign on. I, the, well, the other option, Jennifer, is to just not show your face, but somehow show that you're there. Okay. 
that sometimes that takes pressure off the um, connectivity. Pam Rooney. Here. Okay, thank you. I'm done. So I think we were, were we mid question, Robert? Did, um, no, did you, okay. okay. I just wanna get the prompt to go ahead. Um, so uh, the, the feedback from the smaller property owners is typically related to the costs of the permitting. That's what I would say is probably consistently discussed or brought up. Uh, you know, the, the small property owner paying the same fee as the large uh, multi-unit uh, property. I don't hear any um, feedback specifically regarding access to inspectors or, um, you know, permitting process. Uh, it's all really the same. You know, it, it, it's in with the online uh, option now, which has gotten a lot of great um, positive feedback, um, you know, really, really makes things efficient, not only for our staff and to be able to turn out permits, but also for the, the user. So that's all been positive. So I think really the only feedback I hear is related to fees. And that is something that, um, you know, is also being discussed specifically by the CRC is, you know, how to, how to charge a fee for the, for the size of the unit. We don't do inspections. So it's really, it's all complaint response. So once a, per, once a permit is issued or renewed, most property owners don't ever hear from us throughout the course of the year. Okay, thank you. And I'll give another plug for OpenGov, our permitting software. It's not often that we put a software in place and it does exactly what we want it to do um, and potentially more. And um, this is one of the times where between Rob's office and our uh, Mike Warner and IT, um, it was a really systematic and, and smooth transition. And now we're looking at it for things that we never even thought we would use through OpenGov, like uh, field rental rentals and things like that. Um, so it's a... Uh, that has been a big, big improvement in efficiency. Um, the next question, Rob, uh, I know we talked about this during our budget hearing, uh, the number of inspections appears to have gone way up, but I think you're gonna talk more about OpenGov. And... Yeah, more, more about this program that we've implemented over the past year, year and a half. Uh, so we, we're really able to accurately track every kind of move we make with inspections. And this is, mostly built out in the building electrical plumbing permit uh, pieces of the program. And, and a good example of this would be something like the, the Amherst College Lyceum when the construction's going on there, uh, there could be two, three months worth of uh, inspector con uh, concrete inspections almost daily uh, to see the various pieces of concrete and steel. And in the past, um, that would have been an inspection type that eventually got you know, checked off as a complete. In this new program, every time the inspector makes a visit, it gets documented as an inspection. So it accurately reflects the, the actual, um, you know, activity of each inspector. So it's, um, it's been really valuable that way, where in the past, it would have been like a handwritten note or something that we would have had to keep track of uh, all of our visits. So Rob, just on, so on the inspections that um, I was the one where this came from too, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a jump of about 500 from if I do it all. Is that mainly new construction where, you know, new either that someone is building a whole new wing on a house or, or, or someone is building a whole new building? Yeah, I would say it mostly relates to the larger projects because that's where we do many you know, multiple inspections of each inspection type. In addition to a home, there's gonna be a visit for each stage of construction, maybe two, but these buildings uh, downtown, Spring Street, Southeast Commons, you know, they're daily inspections for um, many parts of the project. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, <clears throat> Robin, I don't know if this is um, falls under you or not, but do we track when homes are sold to LLCs? Um, and do we track if permit, um, if somebody had a permit and then withdrew and chose not to reapply? Yes. So um, I'm kind of going to break that up a little bit. So the, the tracking of the homes to LLCs, what we get and we we've, uh, for years have gotten a monthly report that the assessor's office prepares for us of every transfer. So we'll look at that month to month. There could be anywhere between 10 or 20 properties that transfer and we'll look for those, you know, those new owners that might not appear to be owner occupied. 
uh, if we find something, you know, sometimes it's a, uh, um, an LLC we recognize or an owner we know that's an investor, uh, we send out a letter or contact them to, to make them aware of the program to make sure that they're either uh, transferring an existing permit or applying for the new rental permit. So that's something we've always done and, and are doing currently. Um, the second part of that for uh, permits that have withdrawn or not reapplied, uh, the answer is also yes. Uh, so we have an active list of properties that we follow up with after we get through the renewal period. And I'll remind you that in the past, before OpenGov, the renewal period was very long. It would take all the way to almost October for us to get through processing the renewals. Now it's done much more efficiently so we can spend um, that part of the year following up with permits that didn't get renewed. We are also comparing properties, uh, uh, ownership uh, location, and mailing address uh, through the assessor's records. And we're also looking at assessor's records for uh, all the multifamily properties that, that transfer or don't have permits. So we have an active list of properties that we work through when we have time. So again, you know, we got one, bill, one, one code enforcement officer and when the building inspectors and health inspectors have some time, they'll help out. Uh, office staff will grab a, you know, a list of them and make phone calls and find out. Um, I did a, a kind of a summary today. Uh, we have 1,256, um, and I'm moving into the next part of the question about the increase in the number of permits to explain that, but we have 1,256 permitted properties today uh, active in the program, which is up about 100 from last year as a result of that work that I just explained. Um, we are... Uh, permitting 5,232 units within those uh, properties. 139 of those are owner occupied. Um, and just um, we, as a reminder, when we established the fees last year, the increased fees, there's a reduction for the owner occupied properties. So 139 of them fall into that property, that, that uh, category. And if I didn't just say it, there's 54 properties that are on our watch list, the, the checklist that we're following up on that we haven't got resolution on. So there's, there's 54 properties that are to us at the moment unknown that we're working on. And then I think the last question, and then I've got another additional question. Kathy, um, when you say how well does the on, online work, are you talking about OpenGov? Or are you talking about um, like GIS and um, a different, program um i guess it's 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 the whole piece rob you know you've got online for permits and you've just talked about inspections i mean i think you've basically answered it um I'm just does it uh decrease the amount of staff time compared to what you used to have to do or does it at least allow other kinds of efficiencies so i just wanted your own assessment of the systems you're working with yeah, so the, the OpenGov has absolutely increased efficiency. I mean, it was, you know, at a point where uh, all staff in the office would work on that one particular program for months just to get it processed. Um, so the, the efficiency has been outstanding uh, with OpenGov um, and just kind of switching away from rentals for a minute. It's been really, really helpful and attractive to contractors and homeowners applying for building permits or electrical plumbing permits. Um, it's all, um, you know, online uh, communication. So there could be a, a note left during lunch by a contractor from their phone and, and we can respond. So it, it has really made things, um, you know, much more efficient. It's made communication better with the applicants uh, that we didn't have before, a lot less uh, visits to the office. So all those things have, have added to uh, making the uh, less stressful in the office for the uh, support staff that does that work every day, um, which is very high volume. Uh, like when we look at licensing and permitting um, and in totals for the department, um, you know, pieces of your last question though um, uh, about um, you know, kind of talking about maybe what we have lost and and where there might be some disappointment in the in the online presence. Um, I do think we need some some help with our web pages. Uh, updating them, keeping them current, um, making them better. 
uh, more options available. Uh, it's just something that staff, we talk about it year after year, and we're just not able to do, you know, either by our uh, in-house ability to work with the program and, and build the systems online or just the time. So it is something that, you know, we, we definitely need help with making better. Uh, some of you may know that in the past, we had a lot of great information listed in the mapping system through our GIS. You could get old uh, permits, you can get all the history of complaint uh, response. Uh, if a ticket was issued for a violation, all of that would be there. And um, we unfortunately lost that. Um, it, it's something I can't explain. It's IT related and security or something related that um, you know, I've, I, I know IT is aware of it, concerned about it and looking for better you know, solutions to offer that again. But that's, you know, something that we really miss and the public misses. Uh, and the last thing is that um, we never completed our uh, project to uh, uh, make all of our records digital and readily accessible. So uh, we have some of them done. We have some of them indexed properly and available, and we still have paper uh, copies in storage in North Amherst and to thoroughly do a search of, of a record of a property, it takes going to all those places uh, in a lot of time. So uh, that's something that's kind of on our uh, request list. If that last one was a request from us, that's, you know, those are the things that we're hoping can, can be improved in time. Thank you. So, so Rob, the bonus question is, um, how will how will the new building code and energy code impact your office? Is it going to require more new training, new expertise? Is there more work as a result of that? Um, it seems like it's and it seems like there's a minimal information maybe out there on it right now. But what do you see coming down the road for that? So it, we we've been through it a few times. So you know every time there's a code change, there's absolutely a, you know some education involved. There's a lot of time you know taken to work with applicants. Um, at this stage early on, of course, we don't have a date for the new building code yet, but anticipated sometime between now and January. You know, this is the time where we hear from architects and engineers because they're designing projects that won't go into construction or permitting until next year. So, you know, that is something we're already working on. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety over the new uh, energy uh, codes that are coming out. Uh, we're looking at those in, in, in pretty good detail now. Uh, focused on the, the smaller builder, perhaps, you know, that's going to be uh, having the most trouble to deal with this and maybe um, homeowners that might not be suspecting additional costs and work. Um, our staff will um, likely in the fall get in, there'll be some more training opportunities uh, coming in the fall, I'm told, uh, for a number of these, uh, these subjects that our staff will be getting into. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, um, you know, there's a lot more to come with that, uh, with a possibly January building code, uh, update and then, uh, big changes, uh, mid next year, 24 in the energy codes. Thank you. Lynn. Yeah. Uh, first I need to make sure that Dorothy Pam can hear us and we can hear her. Dorothy. Let me deal with that. Um, I want to actually go to a question that's related to this. We also put into place the whole issue of maintaining home ownership for parts of buildings where we put in ADUs or something. I'm not trying to remember the exact title. I can't come up with it. And I'm not sure of the implementation date, but I wondered if that was rolled into your property transfer numbers earlier and how we're doing on the implementation of that. Because as I recall, that had to also be checked through the records deeds at the county level. So um, about a year ago, we adopted new regulations for ADUs. Um, if I remember correctly, there were maybe 11 or 12 that have been processed through the, you know, that new bylaw as an administrative approval that would have otherwise gone to the, to the zoning board for a special permit. Uh, so there, you know, it's not unusual to see one of those now with the 
uh, deed restriction that gets filed at the registry. That's something that is uh, checked prior to the, uh, in some cases it's at the permit stage if the applicant's comfortable doing that, but certainly by the certificate of occupancy, we're confirming that those are recorded, that those deed restrictions are recorded. Um, and then, you know, those properties are um, given its own classification in our permitting system. So they're easily uh, reportable. Uh, they're a relatively small number at this point, And those are looked at when we uh, see the transfers month to month to confirm that, you know, they're still being occupied by the owner. To my knowledge, we haven't had one that's been in question yet, that there, we haven't been one, seen one that's transferred, that's been granted an ADU uh, and, had, and haven't had to follow up on that. In some cases, they're permitted through the rental program. In some cases, they're not. Okay. And uh, I vaguely remember that we grandfathered previous ADUs uh, through so that they don't have to have an owner-occupied unit there. Um, if the if the deed transfers, do, do they now come under the new law? So no, the new law doesn't affect something that was uh, you know in a, in existence at the time that new law was created. But the old law did require owner occupancy, so that's not a, okay. that's not really a change. Uh, so th it would have been granted a, would have been granted a special permit. The special permit would have been recorded. Uh, at the registry, and it would have had an owner occupancy requirement as well. Got it. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any other questions for inspections? Well, I think that's it then. Rob. Andy, I'm going to try one more time. Dorothy, can you hear us? Okay, we'll try. Rob, thank you. Um, you're welcome to hang, um, hang around and, and see whether questions come up for planning or conservation because sometimes uh, that falls under, you, under your area as well. Um, so next up is planning and we have planning director, Christine Brestrup here. Um, so Christine, do you wanna make a few remarks before we dive into questions? You're muted still. You're still muted. I could note some accomplishments that we're yeah, proud wanna, of. Yeah, sure um, you could. Yeah, so we finally completed the FEMA flood mapping project and we had the town council adopt the zoning amendments that were associated with it. And we're really proud of that and pleased that that project is over. Um, we also completed food and drink establishments, uh, a zoning amendment that reorganized the use categories and permitting paths for these uses that will make it more easy for them to establish themselves. And we um, created an, at least one new category and that zoning amendment was also, also adopted by um, town council. And we have the new uh, preservation of historically significant buildings that we um, wrote last year and town council adopted it with which was the old demolition delay bylaw that went from the zoning bylaw to the um, general bylaw. Um, in addition to that, we've worked with a structural engineer to complete a structural analysis and study of the Boltwood garage to assess its potential for expansion. And we'll be sending that, um, that document to uh, Paul Bockelman for his um, uh, reading it and then um, dispersing or distributing it as he sees fit. Um, we have also completed the design and hired a contractor to fabricate and install the wayfinding sign system. And uh, one of the questions I think has to do with whether there will be parking signs and parking signs are definitely part of that project, both um, pointing in the direction of where parking can be found in the downtown and also um, identifying certain parking lots with, with signs. So that'll be um, a really good addition. Um, We've also been working on the solar bylaw with uh, the solar bylaw working group and we've uh, um, completed the solar site assessment so that's really exciting. And we're finally getting ready to put out the RFP for downtown design guidelines so we're hoping that we'll have a contractor on board by the end of the summer or the beginning of the fall to start that project. Let's see if I have any other things. CBA is really busy with um, solar projects a solar battery installation, as well as a large scale 
um, ground mounted solar uh, project that's coming along. Um, so we're going to be busy with that. And the CBA also has a comprehensive permit coming on the horizon at Ball Lane. And I think you're all um, familiar with that. But that's really exciting because it's going to be 30 home ownership units um, and they'll, they'll all be affordable. Um, and then last but not least, we've been working on a zoning amendment with two members of the council who put it forward earlier this year. So the planning board and the planning staff have been working on that amendment to try to understand its implications and recommend some amendments to um, to make it work better. So that's that's all I have to say in terms of an introduction, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. So the um, the first question, is do you know how many or do you track how many staff hours are spent on council initiated um, zoning measures? Do you track that? No, we don't really track our hours. Um, that's more typical of consulting firms and, and attorneys firms. But, um, you know, we just work on whatever um, needs to be worked on and we don't track our hours. Um, but we have been working with the counselors, the two counselors who put this forward. We've been meeting with them and we've also been meeting with the planning board to understand um, you know, what this amendment would do, what its implications are, what if it has an unintended consequences. And it's been before the planning board multiple times. The next time it's coming to the planning board is June 21st. So um, yes, we've put in a lot of time on that, but we I can't uh, tell you exactly how many hours. And there's a question about um, decline in grant funding. I'm just looking at that, Kathy. That, I imagine that's from the grant page. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't know whether there really has been, Chris, because you've also brought in some really big ones. Um, I know, you know, in terms of your staff, I've always thought you're remarkable uh, for finding things to apply for and actually writing it up in a way that someone gives you the grant. Um, so. Mm -hmm. So if it was just pure numbers, it looked like it was down, um, but I don't, so I should make the question bigger, you know, on are you staffed in a way that um, enables us to go after whatever is out there, um, whether it's roads, sidewalks, um, you know, when you look at the range of what you've been able to bring in, it's, it's impressive. So we have, um achieved some really big grants in the last year, uh, $750,000 Mass Works grant for sidewalks along Belchertown Road, $250,000 Housing Choice grant for a sidewalk along Boltwood Avenue, $75,000 Community Planning grant for streetscape design in the downtown area, and $827,000 in land and water conservation grant for uh, work on the North Common, and that's going to be combined with the Community Preservation Act money that we already have. So um, I'm, I'm not sure why it appears that our grant funding is, is lower than it has been in the past. I, I could say that the shared streets grants are no longer available. So although we had $500,000 in shared streets grants in previous years, that was really associated with um, the COVID epidemic and the state was trying to um, give money to the towns to improve their streetscapes to have more walkability and outdoor dining and things like that. So those grants have uh, are not, as far as I know, available any longer. The other thing that might have affected um, the numbers is that the community development block grant fund is now a two-year grant rather than a one-year grant. So we used to get $825,000 a year as a mini entitlement community. Now we have to apply every other year and we get roughly twice as much money, but it um, comes less frequently. So um, that's what I can say about grants. And maybe Dave has his hand up. He may have some other um, ideas about grants. Yeah, quickly before Dave goes, uh, Kathy, just that chart is an actual spending um, chart. It's not necessarily the volume of grants that were um, awarded or, or overseen by the department. So I think in terms of actual spending from grants, that can sort of ebb and flow from one year to the next in terms of when the when the money is actually spent. Um, so I, I think to Chris's point, I don't think there's been a, a decrease in the number of grants, but FY22 might just have been a down year in terms of the things actually going out the door. Dave?
Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on on Kathy's comments um, and and compliment Chris and really the whole functional area because it's not just the planning department; it's the entire functional area when we're going for for funding at the state or or federal level. And I yeah, I I honestly don't look at the the overall number of grants too much. I do uh, pay attention to the kinds of grants we go for, and and of course you know um, all is involved in in all of those and has to sign off on all of those applications. And we've been very fortunate the last three to five years to bring in a, a tremendous amount of money across the board, whether it's for Hickory Ridge or conservation or sustainability. Um, and of course, um, you know, working closely with DPW on, uh, as Chris mentioned, mass works, sidewalks. The challenge right now, and I, I think Chris may have, may have slipped, slipped Chris's mind, but we have been two planners down in the department for some months. We have luckily brought on uh, Rob Wichilla, who's been who's been great and been here a couple of months. But um, frankly, we are we are um, we are stretched as is DPW to actually carry out all these grants. So the remainder of twenty three, we we're not saying we're not going any for any more grants. There are opportunities we're looking at right now. But um, we've got to carry out all of these projects, including the North Common, um, which has been on the, the radar screen for many years. So it's going to be a busy 23 and a busy 24. And I think you probably heard that from Guilford Mooring as well. So we're still in the hunt for more grants, but we've got to carry out all of the ones we, we have committed to uh, uh, so far. And we're, we're going to keep being aggressive um, uh, in 24 and going for more, more funding. Lynn? Uh, first, I want to just make sure that Dorothy Pam can hear us and that we can hear the her. And can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. I, I I could hear you before. I was on the phone driving back from grandchild picking up, but I couldn't get the mute to undo. So That's I did hear you very nicely. Thank nice you. Nice to see you in person. Yeah. Um, um, I do want to go on to a question uh, that really builds on David of what you're saying, and that is that. Um, are you experiencing um, difficulty hiring the people you need? Uh, and because one of the thing, it's one thing to get the grants, it's another thing, thing to perform on them. And I share your concern about that. I, I don't want to take too much time because I know we have more to cover here, Lynn, but it's, it's a great question. Um, we lost Ben Brager some months ago, and many of you interacted with Ben. He was he was terrific while he was with us. Um, we are certainly feeling his loss even to this day because Ben was shouldering a lot of things. Uh, you know, kudos to Chris and and um, Jeremiah and Stephanie and um, Nate Malloy, who is phenomenal. Um, Nate has stepped in um, and and filled a lot of these these holes. So. We're going to keep all these plates spinning. We're going to move them forward. We're committed, you know, to Mass Works grants and Park grants. Uh, we're, you know, we're trying to move forward on the um, uh, the work uh, outside the Bang Center, outside Room One Hundred One at Bang Center for that new courtyard uh, patio project. Um, and we're working, as I said, with Guilford and and his team, Jason Skeels and Paul Dethier and and Amy Rizeki and others, uh, Beth Wilson. We just put in a, a grant uh, that uh, conservation and um, and DPW uh, uh, teamed up on for the uh, for looking at uh, culvert replacement on Potwine Lane. If you know the where the Plum Brook comes through uh, on Potwine Lane, it has been a problem. It it overtops, it floods, um, and we just put in a grant to the federal government there, which we think we have a good shot at. So we're still in the game. We're still being um, uh, aggressive out there and going for money. But yeah, as Lynn said, we've we've got to. Once we get the money, once we get the grants, we have to perform, and that means uh, contracting and bidding and all of the uh, project management that goes into these things. So we're 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 feeling it, but um, if we can get through twenty three, I think twenty four and twenty five will be uh, hopefully even better. Thanks, Dave. Bernie. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, one one thing I've learned in multiple years on the finance committee here in Amherst is that you, you there's never any doubt 
that uh, planning or in fact, anyone who works for Dave Zomack uh, isn't busy. They're always busy. They're always out, out. They're always they're always doing stuff. And I have it in uh, a good report that they all get to sleep between midnight and 6 a.m. So there's still some uh, additional capacity there. Uh, the question I had for Chris uh, is, you know, we belong to a regional planning uh, agency, and are we getting any significant level of assistance from the RPA in terms of some of the grant writing or in terms of some of the grant management um, or in terms of, of some of the research that uh, your staff has to do in terms of uh, the bylaws and the like? May I answer that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we do get help from uh, Piner Valley Planning Commission. We just finished a um, listening session and develop a, development of an action plan to make Amherst an age-friendly community, which is something that AARP is promoting. Um, I believe Northampton is already an age-friendly community, so we should be getting our designation as a result of this having this plan in place. Um, we're also working with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on an update of our historic preservation plan. So, um, you know, when we uh, identify something where we think we can get help from them, we do that. We worked with them last year on a, um, a zoning amendment to um, help us to figure out how we can permit certain kinds of uses that are uh, temporary in nature, um, some of which may have been able to be um, permitted with article 14 but are no longer able to be and others are that have to do with um entertainment things like you know wineries and breweries and m maybe um you know one-time events or events that happen five times a year or something like that so we have um we've been working with Piner valley planning commission on that we haven't put that forward yet because we've been doing so many other things but that will be coming along. So yes, we do take advantage of them and they're and they're very helpful. Yeah, great, thank you. So Chris, the next question is, um, what would you say the top priority of the planning department is? Is it housing, something else? Um, if it is housing, you know, what areas of town in particular? Yeah, I think it is housing. I mean, I think that we really have a, um, housing issue that we have to solve somehow. We need housing of all different types and all different price points. We need housing for students and we need housing for families. We have managed to uh, produce, I believe it's 800 housing units in the past six years. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, you know, a tremendous number. Uh, I believe we have nine 9,000 something housing units altogether in town. So producing another 800 in, in six years is, is pretty good. Um, we're looking, we're currently looking at East Village as an area that can um, be planned to have more housing. The way it's currently zoned is not um, that conducive to the types of development that we think could happen there. We have some willing landowners, but their <laughs> properties are locked in a certain kind of zoning that's that's outdated as far as we're concerned. And so we need to look at that. Um, we also see the completion of Amir's new building and Amir is planning something on the other side of uh, Southeast Street. So that'll be coming along soon. And Colonial Village is um, slated to be expanded. We've been talking to them about um, their addition of, I think it's 84 units that they're proposing and 10 of them are gonna be affordable. So, you know, we have a kind of a continuous stream of um, housing that's coming through the permitting process, but we'd like to encourage more by looking at some uh, zoning changes. Um, and as you know, we also have Wayfinders that is developing affordable units on Belchertown Road and the East Street School uh, site. So East Amherst seems to be a real hot area for housing development, and it's not, um, you know, five-story buildings. It tends to be lower scale, and um, I think it's a pretty exciting area that we need to study and, and promote housing development via um, some zoning amendments, some clever zoning amendments in that area. Dorothy? Um, just thinking of all that development there, um, there, there is great need for a grocery store in that area. And um, I don't know what role the town can play in that, but it, all this talk about, you know, neighborhood centers and village centers and walkable this and that, if you don't have a grocery store, it's, it doesn't really work. 
Is there anything we can do to get a grocery store in the East Amherst neighborhood, which is really expanding? Um, well, yes. Um, and one of the things that people have been looking at is actually expanding the, the geographic um, borders of the East Amherst Village Center, maybe even going as far as um, Maplewood Farm and mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out how we can um, maybe turn that into something that would be an active uh, right. place again. Um, so we are, you know, considering that as a, as an issue that needs to be addressed for the village center. Okay. Sounds interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lynn? You know, I want to go back to the discussion on regional uh, cooperation. Is Pioneer Valley addressing the issue of housing as a regional issue? Uh, this particularly came up on Friday at um, the round table that Mindy Dom held. Alicia was there as well as Anna. And the fact that, for example, Hadley, which is right on literally some of the university sits on in Hadley, uh, yet they aren't willing to step to the plate and build multi-unit buildings. Um, as if somehow or another Amherst should be the only place that absorbs that population. So I'm just curious when we go back to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, whether any of those are active discussions at all. I know that they have um, a regional plan for the area and housing is part of it, but I don't think that they take on a role of kind of encouraging or what should I say, identifying individual cities and towns that they think need to take action in some way. I think they more respond to cities and towns coming to them and saying, we need help with whatever the topic is or whatever the issue is. So um, that's kind of how they've been working. Um, but maybe they need to approach <laughs> some of these cities and towns and say, you need to do your share. Well. Um, yeah, Eastern Mass did it, but they did it with state law. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Um, the next question is about impact or linkage fees um, from new developments. And are there any discussions going on about possibly requiring that in the future? I know we've discussed it yeah, anecdot well, anecdotally, but. To my knowledge, Massachusetts um, hasn't really supported um, imposing impact fees on developments. There may have been some recent changes, and maybe Rob would know about that, but in the past, Massachusetts has not really um, encouraged that, and, it, and I believe it's actually against the law. But if you can prove that um, a development has an impact on um, infrastructure, like you know, roadways or um, particularly intersections, um, then you can get a developer to pay for improvements to those intersections. The problem is it's kind of hard to um, show that uh, that one particular development, unless it's really huge, has an impact that it would lower the level of service that um, is currently at a particular intersection. So. Um, and traffic engineers are pretty clever about, you know, proving that their projects don't uh, have an impact on level of service. So, but that is one place where you can often get developers to pay for some in infrastructure improvements if you can prove that their uh, the level of traffic has gone up that much or will go up that much. Andy, yeah, uh, Chris, the on May fourth uh, we got. Um, with the newsletter from the Division of Local Services of the Department of Revenue, and it was regarding linkage fees and promoting the use of linkage fees in Massachusetts, and they seemed to think that it was absolutely legal. So I will forward that to you after the meeting today and, for, and put it in the packet for uh, finance committee members to see that. But uh, I got a very different message when I read my regular DLS newsletter. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Andy, um, I just pulled it up. It, it does seem like it has to be through special legislation. 
um, if you pull that up, it does seem like in order to, to get them in place, you have to have special legislation. Um, Lynn? Yeah, this is actually a combination of Chris and Rob, um, but it relates to the issue of impact. And that is that I can only give you an example, but I know there's others. Uh, a builder spends a lot of time building a new property and in the process tears up the road in front of the property. Do our do we require them to pay for the road repair? If they damage the road or the sidewalk, then we require them to rebuild it in the, you know, to the state that it was in previously. Is that stated anywhere in our permits? It's not stated in um, site plan review or special permit, but um, I don't know. Is it is it stated in a building permit, Rob? No, no, it's not stated in any of the permits that we issue in in conservation and development. It could perhaps be part of uh, you know curb cut permits or utility connection permits that are issued from DPW. Uh, I would personally, I'd wait to hear from the town engineer that something's been damaged and needs repair, and then I would, you know, pursue getting it fixed. You know, leading up to the end of a project uh, prior to prior to releasing the final certificate of occupancy would be the the opportunity to have make sure that happens. Thank you. All right, the next set of questions are on um, the North Common and downtown. Um, so, uh, and Paul, you may want to jump in on this as well. Um, the first one is about loss of parking um, and, and how that may impact uh, this parking in general downtown, losing the, the main street lot. Um, I think that um, Dave Zomek may be able to address that better than I can, but um, I know that the DPW is always looking for on-street parking, and they're pretty clever about finding it here and there. They've done a good job about finding some on Spring Street and Dickinson and other places around downtown, and I know mm -hmm. it's probably not, um, you know, replacing, what was it, 29 spaces, I think, out in front of Town Hall, but um, we are also... We have a request in for a capital um, uh, capital work. I think it's fifty thousand dollars, and part of that um, we've requested that we be able to hire a consultant to help us look around downtown to see if there are other locations besides Boltwood Garage and um, North Prospect Street to uh, provide us with um, a location for parking. Um, I was not part of the plan where back in parking was taken out of the North Common project, so I don't really understand what the discussion was about that, but my um, understanding, I guess my sort of um, just looking at the at the plan, I would imagine that they took it out because it was too close to the bus stop and too close to the uh, intersection, so it, I think it was only seven spaces, so that's why the back in parking was taken out. Um, and yeah, so I guess that's what I have to say about that. Um, yeah, uh, I would just quick, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so just adding to that, um, so we are looking at additional you know, where we can find additional spaces to accommodate the um, loss of the current spaces, and um, so it's, it's lower than twenty nine because it's you know if we were to just repave that lot, it would be lower than that, right? It just it's not a one for one because of its sizing things. The other thing is to um, help to educate people about where parking is available. And that goes with the signage that we've been talking about, because there is, you know, you can come downtown, you'll see a lot filled, but you'll see two lots virtually empty, like the one behind Town Hall and the CVS parking lot. So uh, we've looked at different options available to promote those slots and to make them, make them easier to get to. So I think that's all gonna be part and parcel of the common, um, of common work. We've also yeah. discovered recently, I must um, say that Amherst College lets people park in their alumni lot at night when their people aren't there. So anybody who's coming downtown to have dinner who's able to walk can park there and go have dinner or go to the movie theater or whatever. It's a kind of a, a secret, but not now, anymore. Now you all know that, right? 
and, and there is a plan to bring back some proposals for additional parking in the summer. They're not necessarily downtown, but they're not far away from downtown um, to, to expand the supply of parking. Dorothy? Um, <clears throat> we had the special parking district downtown before the new apartments got built. And that lot still has is not fully developed. I'm just wondering, is there any move to drop that? Because that's caused a lot of problems for a lot of people and has pushed a lot of parking from the people who live in those buildings into the residential uh, neighborhoods. Um, so, because I know there's more building planned or it's, it's coming along. Well, I don't know, but I suspect strongly. Is there any does move to to say, okay, we did that and we got a lot of new building. Now let's say that if you build, you must provide some parking at least. I think there's a need to reevaluate the municipal parking district. So that's a project that we need to think about managing, taking on in the future. Thank you. Um, the next question related to the North Common is the, um, uh, these are just sort of topics, you know, has it been discussed the impact on downtown businesses? Um, what is currently the thought process around the timing of when there will be a disruption? That's probably a Dave question. So, yeah, just quickly, we've had a lot of discussions with and through the bid in the Chamber of Commerce. Paul and I met with uh, bid in chamber members uh, probably six weeks, eight weeks back, had a really good discussion with them in the town room, um, representation from a lot of different businesses. And yes, we spent some time on the loss of parking. As Paul said, we're going to continue with DPW to investigate uh, finding, you know, looking at uh, re reorienting uh, and, and restriping where we can to pick up spaces around the edges. But by and large, um, we feel as though the outreach to businesses has been done over the last five years. And in general, there's kind of an anticipation that this is going to be a good thing for downtown as construction begins to happen. And um, just a quick update on that. Um, the project will go out to bid any day now. Um, we will likely, uh, again, we don't know whether it will start this fall or in the spring of 24 at this point. Um, we know there are some, uh, one, one important uh, element of the project is granite, and we know that there is kind of a backlog for granite. We're going to need a lot of new granite curbing and uh, walkway curbing. So um, the project is, is likely to start in the spring of 24, and we'll work with DPW on kind of managing that disruption. So I don't think there's any plans to close that parking lot anytime soon, and that'll be up to you know, Paul working with DPW and and uh, so so we'll get, you know, get that out to bid and then bids will come back and we'll decide on the lowest qualified bidder later this summer and go from there. Can we get anything done in 23? Possibly, but more likely the bulk of the construction will happen in 24. And we'll have to work on, you know, around graduation and, and other major events on the common farmer's market, et cetera. The, the lowest priced qualified bidder, lowest price. I'm sorry, what did I say? <laughs> Low, lowest qualified, that's, I know what you meant. Oh, I'm sorry, um, lowest, yes, lowest bid, um, qualified bidder. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Chris, you already mentioned this a little bit. Um, can you talk about the timing for design standards um, and, and how they may impact new projects that are being proposed? Yeah, so Rob and Nate and I just had a meeting today um, looking at the draft uh, RFP for design standards. So we have $100,000 from the town and we have $75,000 from the state from the community planning um, grant to put together to hire a consultant to help us with design standards. And um, we're, we're thinking that this RFP is going to go out very soon, as soon as we can work with accounting to um, put it out on the street. And the hope is that we would have a consultant um, on board by the end of the summer or the beginning of September. And at that point, it would be, um, there'd be a big community input effort to um, hold forums to hear from um, everyone about, you know, what they like and what they don't like about the downtown and how it can be improved. And um, it's gonna be probably a two year process to uh, work through that. 
Um, but I'm very excited about it, and I, I think it's going to be really um, a good process for all of us to have our say. So the next question, Chris, is around um, Fort River school intersections um, with the new school approved and um, a new housing going in there. Are there any plans for um, applying for grants for that area for intersections or sidewalks? Um, the Fort River School is part of the East Village Center. So um, I think that if we can tie work on on the streets to commercial projects in the village center, we have a better chance of getting a Mass Works grant. I don't know if a Mass Works grant would be um, would be looked at in the positive way if it were just associated with the school, because you have to show that you have to show the state that there is a commercial benefit and that there are is job creation as a result of what you're doing. Um, so. Um, you know, we can certainly look at that and think about that. We did get a Mass Works grant for the sidewalks along Belchertown Road, and we used the Colonial Village expansion as um, one of the things that was going to be benefiting from those sidewalks. And so, you know, there may be other projects that we can bring into an application process for a Mass Works grant in the vicinity of the Fort River School. So we'll have to think about that carefully. Kathy? Um, Chris, just um, I, I, as I said, I think you all are masters at getting these grants. There, when you and I listened in on a session with the state, one of the things they said is there was a grant program for intersections near schools. Um, mm -hmm. and that was the one that, like my my ears went up when it said that specifically for schools. So it wasn't so much for job development, but for yeah. the safety of kids. So it might be good to just put that on the radar screen in combination with the housing that's going in there, um, mm -hmm. because it's we've got two that are near the school. <laughs> so thanks. And just to add to that, DPW, I mean, part of the work is to have the engine an engineering firm look at that those two intersections. And now that we know sort of pretty much how the flow of traffic is going to flow into the school, because that work is pretty much done now. Uh, DPW will begin doing some engineering analysis of the impact because we want, again, we want to be consistent with it when the school opens that the traffic doesn't become a nightmare immediately. So we want to be, have addressed that prior to that. So the last question um, is around the North Amherst Village intersection uh, with the new Ball Lane project. Um, and I guess uh, planning and what your thoughts are on that intersection and what's in the development up there. So we applied for a MassWorks grant. I think it was three times in uh, three times, probably not in a row. But um, yeah, we know that that intersection needs to be improved. We tried to tie it to the North Square development, which we thought was had a pretty good chance of being um, accepted, but that wasn't um, good enough. So the state, you know, as I said before, really wants to see some kind of commercial development associated with. Uh, Mass Works grant. And so, you know, I know that landowners up in that vicinity have plans for their properties. And, and you know, as those pro projects develop, we can see how we could tie those into a Mass Works grant. Um, I'm not sure I have more to say about that, but that certainly hasn't fallen off our radar screen that uh, that the issue is there. Thank you. Any final questions for planning? All right, well, thank you, Chris. Um, again, welcome to hang around. So our, our final uh, functional area department is conservation and sustainability. Um, Assistant Town Manager Dave Zomack and Sustainability Director Stephanie Ciccarello are here. Um, Dave, Stephanie, do either of you wanna say anything briefly before we dive into questions? Um, if I could, John, I think enough has been said about the functional area. Um, so I, I will, not add anything to that, but I did maybe want to give Stephanie a chance to kind of lead with sustainability here. I can move through the conservation questions fairly quickly, but I, I did want the group to kind of hear all of the amazing work that, not all, some of the amazing work and projects that, that she's got um, before us. She's working with a number of different committees and boards and 
So if Stephanie could have a couple of minutes and then you could uh, uh, present some of the questions you might have to her and I'm happy to cover conservation at the very end. I'm sensitive to the time at 6.36 as well. So Thanks. if that works for you and Stephanie, that'd be great. That sounds good. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, um, Stephanie, uh, was helpful uh, at putting together a new section that will stay in the budget going forward around all the town sustainability initiatives and sort of an update on those projects and the different um, uh, Stephanie is a, a master of juggling multiple things all at once with no money uh, <laughs> or no town money um, and so you'll you'll see a list of all those things on that uh, on those couple pages um, so Stephanie uh, go ahead sure so um, thank you all so much um, I feel a little bit like a the department head without a department, like the person without a country. But I really um, appreciate all the support that Dave's given for the sustainability work, um, especially Dave's been really great um, in championing a lot of the work with me. And I feel like we've accomplished so much in this past year. Um, I, you know, the, the highlights are really um, certainly the solar landfill project, which I think everyone knows about, but um, we're moving forward with our community choice aggregation effort, and that's working with two other communities, and that will have a townwide impact. So we are looking to launch um, a community outreach event, and that's going to happen on January, on, I'm sorry, June 6th. Our community comment period will begin June 1st and go through June 30th, and that will really be the start of really formalizing that that process moving forward. Um, so that will have a, I think, a big impact on the town. Um, we just recently completed a solar assessment with the help of um, GZA Consulting. And that work was done in collaboration with both the Energy and Climate Action Committee, as well as the Solar Bylaw Working Group. And that was to look at the feasibility for solar um, development within the town. And it wasn't just looking at ground mounted large scale solar, it was really looking at the feasibility for any solar within the town. And we sort of were able to identify about a third of the town that's left that's sort of feasible for development. It doesn't say exactly where it can go, but it sort of moves that process forward. And that's tied with the solar bylaw um, that is being developed by the solar bylaw working group. And I've been working with Chris Brestrip on that initiative. Um, I think there's um, a lot of focus now moving forward on implementing the ARPA funded projects. So right now we're gonna be looking to create a community dashboard with the information for um, climate work and sustainability efforts will be on the town website. And we're also looking to get some um, inventories done. We're looking at, I'm sorry if you hear my dog whining in the background, I apologize. Um, we are having a few inventories done. One is for a building inventory of all the municipal buildings um, to look at the um, uh, HVAC systems and transitioning those buildings to electrification away from fossil fuels. And then we're also going to be doing an inventory on our fleet vehicles. Um, and that will give us a sense of where we are with greenhouse gas emissions pertaining to our fleet. And we're looking to see how we can trans uh, transfer those and transition those away mm -hmm. from fossil fuel use again towards electric vehicles. And there'll be kind of a time frame laying that out as well. Um, there are other initiatives and I could keep going, but I don't, I don't know if there are specific questions. So I just want to let you know that, you know, uh, moving forward, I think we're looking, I'm looking to um, really collaborate more with the Energy and Climate Action Committee on implementation of um, the Climate Action Plan. So there's one there's one uh, submitted question specifically around sustainability, and then maybe we'll open it up for see if there's any other committee questions before we go to the uh, more conservation focused questions. Um, Stephanie, can you talk about uh, some of the grants and the you know the process you use for applying for those grants? Is it is it one person applying for them? Is it a team effort? Um, and do you feel like we are missing any potential grants uh, due to staff time restrictions? Sorry, um, I would say that we're, um, I wouldn't say that we're missing grants. I feel like we're, um, you know, it, we have to be somewhat strategic in the in the grants that we go for. Even with the Green Communities funding, it doesn't always make sense to apply every year um, because that funding is somewhat limited and the maximum amount that we can um, 
we can get. So um, I'm working very closely with the facilities manager um, on our next round of funding because we want to look to electrify town hall. And that would mean, um, you know, creating and moving town hall to being a net zero building. Um, so that's something that, you know, um, that funding will come. I don't, so I don't think that's like a lack of staffing. Um, it's just more strategic timing, I would say. And as far as um, other grants, it's, it depends on what the, what the project is. I know, for instance, there's a resiliency project, an MVP grant that I've worked with Aaron Jacques on. It's really kind of been more of a department effort um, looking to um, get an MVP grant, which is a municipal vulnerability preparedness grant for the resiliency of Puffer's Pond and the surrounding area. That will be a really big effort. Um, and again, that was kind of a team effort in, in getting that grant proposal submitted. And that was also, we hired a consulting firm, Fuss and O'Neill, to work with us on that effort. Um, I think, you know, other, you know, again, like I said, ARPA funding, I think, is something that was somewhat of a team effort. Um, but I think, you know, implementation, I will certainly be overseeing those projects that are related to sustainability. Uh, but I, you know, again, it, at some point, if we have more staffing, it would certainly help. Oh. But I don't think a lack of additional staffing has hindered our ability to access any grants at this time. Thank you, Stephanie. And I've heard that noise before. It means it's I'm dinner. Sorry. It's dinner. It's dinner time for your dog. That's what my dog does. <laughs> and I apologize for scheduling this during <laughs> dog's dinner time. I'm so um, sorry. That's right. Pam. Thanks. I was going to ask if there's a stat uh, status update on the survey or the study of the underutilized town owned facilities. Um, where where are we on that? I think I had volunteered to be part of that if somebody wanted me, but I haven't heard anything. Um, so there, so we are bringing in a fellow from the University of New Hampshire Sustainability Institute this mm -hmm. summer, who is going to be doing a whole scale um, inventory of the municipal buildings, and we'll be identifying the um, HVAC systems and then creating um, kind of a timeline of transitioning those buildings away from fossil fuels. So that's moving forward this summer. Um, and we'll have the fellow from June through uh, the end of August. Right. Um, and, and Dave, you're leading a, you were going to update the um, the policies and procedures or take a look at the policies and procedures related to vacant buildings, right? Right, this is kind of an interesting dovetail. I'm not sure Stephanie answered a, a corollary question. I'm not sure it was Pam's question, but it is great to get an update on looking at all the, the current systems in all of our buildings. But we're also, Pam, I think it came up at a council meeting, I don't know, a month or so ago. And, and so I've been tasked with looking at our current um, surplus um, uh, surplus property policy, which was developed a couple of years ago. I don't think it needs a lot of work. And then, you know, um, particularly Rob and I working with Nate Malloy and and with some input from, from Chris uh, are, are looking at, you know, some of the buildings that would likely be, you know, logical places for reuse you know, i.e. The, the, the East Street School for many years was kind of sitting idle. And now we know that that has uh, been, been uh, folded into the Wayfinders project and that'll have six affordable units in it. And, you know, we don't, we don't have a lot of surplus property, um, but, um, you know, the South Amherst School comes to mind. There are uh, some acres uh, off of Strong Street that come to mind. Of course, we're gonna talk about Hickory Ridge in a few minutes. Um, but we'll look at all of those properties as part of that process. Are there any, um, I was going to try to keep us on sustainability for now. Are there any questions on sustainability? Andy, is your, is your sustainability Well, mine's sort of half and half. Uh, okay, go ahead. The, uh, something that Stephanie and I have talked about before, which is the uh, status of the bike share program and the fact that uh, the provider, the, the company that has been running it about the bankruptcy and uh, Northampton is renegotiating. Is there any uh, risk that in the renewal that the town share 
of the expense will increase and is that something that we uh, need to at least be aware of as a possible future cost so um, so yeah i'll jump in on this one so there is some litigation being examined by the various attorneys for the various communities um i don't you know so, so at this point that's sort of where, where that this situation is with the valley bike so anything you want to add stuff I, yeah, I would say that um, moving forward, I think one of the things that we're understanding about bike share systems uh, kind of whole scale um, is that the operations piece has been um, something that often isn't accounted for with the um, municipal participation, unless you have a really big network sponsor like a, a Nike or a, um, you know, Citibank. Um, it's also a, a challenging piece to fund. And I think, you know, moving forward, no matter what model that we get, you know, we look to, it is potentially an increased cost uh, in the future, um, the operations piece. So, um, but again, we don't know what that would be. I can't tell you what that amount might be, but I think it is something that we need to be cognizant of. And we're, you know, the the group is really looking for creative ways to see how that might be covered. So as much as possible that it doesn't fall squarely on the shoulders of the municipalities that are participating, um, maybe through other agencies, but um, it, it may it may at least in part fall on the shoulders of the municipalities. So again, I, I don't have more than that at this point. I'm sorry. That's right. Thank you. Dorothy? Um, Three three quick things and um, one just a, on the bike since you were talking about it, I never had a sense of how much they were used. When I would go by, I'd often see bikes parked there. And I know you have to have a credit card in order to do it. So that gets rid of a lot of people. Was it really high utilization? Oh yes, absolutely. Especially with um, the UMass campus. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of, um, a lot of usage uh, with the UMass campus being involved. And at times we were the second, you know, depending on the, the season uh, and the time, sometimes we were like the second largest user of the entire network. So okay. we had quite a bit of user. And part of the reason you see bikes in the stations all the time is because there's supposed to be bikes in the stations. So that's part of the operations piece. And I'm glad you brought that up because they actually need staffing to go from station to station mm -hmm. and balance the bikes, if you will, and make sure that there's at least a certain number of bikes in the stations at all times. Okay. So that sounds like really uh, in terms of reducing student need for cars, that sounds like a good solution. That uh, was one of the reasons why we pursued it. <laughs> that was a big reason actually. So my, my second one is, when you talk about making the town buildings uh, zero, uh, net zero, you don't mean you're converting from oil to gas. You mean you're going to do it with heat pumps and solar completely? Not, um, not, uh, not completely. So um, when I was talking about the um, town hall, I was specifically talking about um, moving to electrification. And mm -hmm. if we have a more um, greener electricity supply then that reduces the the reliance on fossil fuels and sort of counts towards greening if you will um the building okay though i do remember there was a time when the last thing you wanted to do was to buy a house an all electric house because that was a disaster but that was a bit we're ago. moving yeah we're not in that time anymore <laughs> we're doing so, quite, we're doing entirely the opposite Okay, so the last item is I had a, a guest from out of town here this past weekend, did a lot of driving around with her. And her one big comment about this town was she loved the trees. And I see the trees as being really important in terms of reducing the need for air conditioning, because like we don't need it. We don't, we have them, but we don't have to use them more than maybe five days a year. Um, and also in terms of heat. So I just wanted to put in a plug for trees that she, she was just amazed. She just said, the trees are astonishing. They're st and she loved it. I just wanna make sure that we keep the effort on to keep our trees. I know it's a challenge. I know it's a challenge. I, I think that as a member of the conservation department and um, having been worked working for that department for a total of 26 years now, I agree, we love our trees. 
And, you know, there is a lot of value in trees. Yeah. And just Thank so you, you know, the, the TSO committee is looking to have some targeted discussions and trees is one of those targeted areas they want to have a discussion about. Any other questions for sustainability? All right, we'll move um, on to conservation questions. So Dave, the, um, the first conservation question is about how priorities are set for trails and minor bridges um, and how do users, um, how do users of trails let conservation know if they find uh, planks are broken or there's damage at a trail? Sure, great, great question, Sean. Um, so first off, there's um, there's a couple of ways that people can let us know. There's a place on our website um, where you can report trail issues, bridge issues, uh, trash. Um, they we also have a conservation general email where we get concerns, complaints, um, and then uh, we get a fair number through C Click Fix that comes in through DPW, where people are a little confused as to who has responsibility for what. And then, frankly, we all in the department, including inspection services, uh, our, our central um, uh, office staff get um, inquiries or concerns. So eventually they all make it, many of them make it to me or to Aaron Jock, our wetlands administrator. And then if we can't address them, uh, they may be something in the field. So Brad Borderweek, our land manager, uh, gets those. Um, he also gets them on his um, a phone, which is out, his office is out at Cherry Hill Golf Course. And um, so there's four or five different ways that people can get concerns and complaints to us. And then we address them as they come in, depending on the priority. Um, the first part was how are priorities set? Um, they are, it's kind of a combination. Again, it, it's it's a collaborative effort in the office. We have um, lists of priority projects based on, <clears throat> excuse me, based on complexity, um, based on um, how much permitting the project uh, requires. Some of the some of the priorities are are set based on the um, how many people use the, typically these are trail related projects or puffers pond related projects. So sometimes a project that has high visibility, high usage, a lot of people use trail X versus trail Y, oftentimes that project will uh, be a higher priority. We are like any other project in town, we're running into challenges with cost, uh, cost escalation. So bridges that might have been done, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago and cost $2,500 might now cost $15,000. So um, we try to permit all of these. So they go through uh, the Conservation Commission if they um, are near a wetland or over a river or stream in a resource area. Um, and then in recent years, um, it's been great working with Rob and he has gotten uh, involved in some of these projects and helped us to both design and uh, permit um, um, new parking lots, improved par parking lots, bridges, things like that. Um, we also work with the Conservation Commission, so we update the Conservation Commission. Uh, Aaron and I meet with them twice a month, and we um, um, update them on projects, get their input on uh, projects that need to be accomplished. So there's a series of lists. I wish the list wasn't that long, but they are they are very long and very expensive. I mean, right now, you know, it's it's a couple of years out. We have that much of a backlog to get all of the projects done. Keep in mind, there's 80 miles of trails, over 2,000 acres of land, Mount Pollock's Puffer's Pond, and the list goes on. So it's a big list, and we try to work through it. Thanks, Dave. Um, can you talk about community gardens um, at Fort River and potentially a bridge uh, to the fields? Sure. First of all, Stephanie's been very involved and done amazing work with the um, garden committee. I may not have gotten their, their official name right, but there's been a tremendous amount of resident involvement in the planning and organizing and carrying out that wonderful new garden at the Fort River um, farm off of um, Belchertown Road. 
all along, and I can remember presenting the project to town meeting, I talked about the opportunity to connect the, the conservation land, the community gardens and the trail there with Fort River School. This was long before the decision was made to uh, move, or excuse me, uh, uh, to put the new school there. So yes, it's absolutely a connection between Fort, the, 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 the new site, the new school, and um, and the uh, conservation area is is and has always been in the plan there. Um, at one time, I actually had a donated bridge from the university in mind because there was a professor there. I believe he was an engineering professor, and he he had collected old bridges. I think those bridges have long since moved on to other places. But anyway, the the plan is to connect the the the, the conservation area with um, with the new school. The plan is also to try to make a connection between the, the conservation area and the Wayfinder project so that residents of that project can make their way down. It's it's a pretty easy walk, but um, we'll we'll do the best we can to, uh, we got a couple of years here before those projects um, come to fruition. Thank you. Um, David, it looks like volunteers decreased um, and your service level charts, do you have a plan to expand? Can you talk about how you recruit volunteers? Um, and could there be community or uh, teams in particular areas of volunteers? Yeah, I don't have those figures right in front of me, but honestly, I think we went from an estimate to more realistic data collection on how many volunteers we we're actually looking, looking, uh, um, uh, interacting with every year. So I think that's really it wasn't a precipitous fall off. It wasn't a cliff, you know. Of, of we we're not working with volunteers. I will say, and we're challenged by you know the opportunity to work with volunteers. Um, you know, is townwide. It's a it's a wonderful thing. The thing we're challenged by with only two FTEs in the department is simply time. Um, you know, it'd be wonderful again, ideally, if the town had a volunteer coordinator. I think our community um, outreach folks, Angela Mills and Jennifer Moyston and, and Brianna Sunred have done a wonderful job and they've really increased, you know, the opportunities for volunteers, but um, it's really just a time and a time management um, uh, situation. The volunteers need, they need, um, they need communication, they need constant and, and consistent coordination and and organizing, and we often are simply trying to get things done. So uh, in, in the last year or so, we've partnered with the Kestrel Trust. They've been wonderful, and we've we've had a, a number of volunteer projects happen out there. In fact, there's some wonderful things going on um, on the Robert Frost Trail out in the Lawrence Swamp. Uh, we've had some um, some uh, um, uh, for-profit uh, businesses volunteer their staff on certain Fridays. They come out and build bridges. Uh, you may all know David Mullen, who uh, is a very active member of our community, and he has organized some terrific events working on uh, raised boardwalks in the Lawrence Swamp area. So, uh, and we just had a, a volunteer cleanup at Amethyst Brook in Puffers Pond. So we do what we can with with the resources we have, it'd be wonderful if we had a volunteer coordinator. I think they could help, help a lot of departments, but we're doing the best we can with who we have now. Dave, did something happen um, to the, we, we, we used to track watershed acres managed, um, and then we sort of stopped tracking it. Was there something with the collection system for the data that we changed? Yeah, it wasn't so much a data collection issue, Sean, as um, a couple of years ago, and I, I don't have the which fiscal year it was, but we actually, um, for as long as I can remember and beyond me working for the town of Amherst, um, our land manager used to assist in the management of our watershed lands in Shutesbury and Pelham. And, uh, you know, under during Paul's tenure and working with Guilford Mooring, the superintendent of public works, we decided a couple of fiscal years ago to move that under that management under uh, DPW fully. Um, you know, our land manager will help when necessary. There's a lot of collaboration between and among departments. So um, that that data or that change in the reporting simply reflects moving that fully over into DPW's um, bailiwick. You're, you're just getting these questions, Dave, because I stared at the 
table on page 167. And, and, <laughs> and you know, volunteers went from 225 down to 75. So that's a data issue. And then land managed went from well over 3,000 to none. Um, but thank you. That's, you know, I'm, that's, I'm that's just making notes on the table. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So we didn't, uh, uh, yeah, in short, we didn't abandon managing our watersheds. We just shifted that responsibility to other staff. Thank you. In DPW. And, and we help, you know, it's, it's not like we don't help. It's just more accurately reflected the way it is. So Dave, before we get into a discussion on Hickory Ridge, um, the last question before that is um, uh, how you collaborate with DPW. Um, and you know, do you share any, I think this is referencing, do you share any equipment, tools, things like that? Sure. You know, across the board, there's a lot of collaboration. You know, I'm looking at, at um, the two chiefs in the uh, waiting to, to follow us. And, and I was just thinking of a, a project we just, you know, we just um, collaborated with Amherst Fire. Uh, they were fortunate enough to get the dive team uh, from the region to come and train at Puffer's Pond. So, you know, there's all sorts of opportunities for collaboration and they happen fluidly within the organization. Um, you know, Rob works with the DPW uh, electrical uh, crew and their team. Um, we work on, we collaborate with uh, DPW around testing for Puffer's Pond and um, some of the swimming areas along the Fort River. We collaborate you know, monthly with Alan Snow and his team, and we share equipment when we can. I will say that the, the ongoing challenge always is when they need the equipment, we need the equipment. There's a very small window of field season here in New England that may be changing given climate patterns, but for now, uh, we need to get things done between April 1st and November 1st. And so when the grass is growing, the trees are growing, um, there's people out on our parks, our commons, and our conservation land. We simply need to get things done. Um, but again, Brad Borderweek, our land manager, Alan Snow and his crew have a great working relationship and they uh, collaborate where they can. A great example um, is right now we have, Brad is the only staff we have in conservation. So we have a couple of dangerous trees to take down and Alan will collaborate with Brad on taking those down with the bucket truck. Because of course, conservation does not have a bucket truck nor do we need one, but there are complex um, tree removal and, and tree safety issues when, when you need to take one of these down. I would say right now on trails, we probably have, I'm gonna say we have 50 trees down across trails. In many, in many cases, they're not a big issue. Brad and his team will get to them um, and again, prioritize them based on um, how active that trail is and whether anybody can go around them, go over them, or if they're dangerous. It always starts with, our, are the trees hung up on other trees? That is a high priority. We get to those, we take them down. But if it's something that somebody can jump over or walk around, they may get done in turn a little bit down the way. Stephanie? Um, actually, I can wait. I just wanted to make a, a, um, a statement of clarification before you all um, finished after Dave is done. Um, do, you can do it now if you want. We're going to go to Hickory Ridge after. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to go back and I wanted to apologize about my dog. Um, I made a statement that I referred to the town hall project as being a net zero project. And what I meant to say was a fossil fuel building. That was our That was going to be our first initiative to be fossil fuel free and to be 100% um, electrification. So I just want to apologize. I got very distracted by my dog chewing on my arm. So sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks. Uh, Bernie? Yeah, I, um, uh, Dave, I'm not going to mention parking. Um, I just want to point out that the trail system that we have here and our, you know, this goes to the larger question of recreation as well, is a real trip generator. It brings people into town. And so the work that Dave does in terms of the, and his crew does in terms of conservation and the trail system is an, is, has a direct economic benefit to the town. And we should probably think of ways we might direct people um, into the town center or into one of the, um, the neighborhoods 
based on the the activity that they uh, they they've been having and you know visiting us and walking on the trails. And so, thank you. You're great. Yeah, if I could just say, it reminds me of a comment Rob made a few minutes ago that, you know, oftentimes we're so busy trying to get the work done, and Rob mentioned websites. We, Aaron Jock and, and Brianna and others have, you know, done their very best to update our websites, but that's a wonderful way to promote the town, and I think we could do, honestly, a better job on the conservation website, really promoting all the assets we have. They bring in visitors. Um, they, you know, the trails and puffers and, and Mount Pollux and others, other areas bring in repeat visitors, families, generations of families. Um, but we, we honestly could do a better job at promoting those assets. They're a, they're a tourist attraction and we don't, we don't do a good enough job, I think, uh, kind of promoting those. And, and um, you know, we certainly could spend some time on that when we, when we have a moment. Stephanie, is it a new hand or a oh, thank you. Um, So Dave, the last question is around Hickory Ridge and can you discuss uh, sort of the status of Hickory Ridge um, as it relates to possibly affordable housing, the fire station, other ideas and how um, public input has sort of been incorporated into that process? Sure, very quickly, because um, I know you want to wrap and get to fire. Um, there's a lot happening at Hickory, around Hickory. Um, I will say the major focus right now is the solar, the initiation of the solar project uh, by AMP Energy at, at Hickory. It is a major project on town land. It will be, um, it will be under construction, I think, um, likely through November of this year. So it's a fairly long duration uh, project. We also have um, the ADA trail uh, project that we got a park grant, a, a state park grant to do. That is under design right now. Hopefully construction will start in the fall. We are designing the core trail that will take visitors from Pomeroy Lane and the Village Center all the way up to East Hadley Road and, and the neighborhoods along East Hadley Road. Um, and we're also in the process of finishing the comprehensive plan that I talked about once we purchase the land. That comprehensive plan will include all the baseline information. We've done a tremendous amount of work. We've already completed a full, a full wetlands assessment of the entire property. We are nearing completion on an ecological restoration uh, plan for the entire property. We are nearing completion on a massing study looking at the frontage along Pomeroy Lane. This will look at um, the opportunity for a fire station, the possibility of co-locating another um, a modest building there. It could be, it could be a community center, it could be a senior center. You know, we could look at needs for other community buildings. Uh, after we get through um, the, the, the four priority projects we're talking about. And of course, that massing study will also look at co-locating um, uh, uh, affordable housing there. Um, I have been talking about a, a senior affordable housing there as a really good fit, I think. So I think um, Paul and I have talked about me coming to do some sort of an update for the, uh, for the council in the fall which I think makes perfect sense. But behind the scenes, we've been doing a lot. We've been really pulling together all this information that we didn't have before we owned the property. And then we will, I think the fall would be a good time to begin to face the community again and um, jumpstart our kind of interactive phase with the community and starting probably with a, a, an update to the council and then some community meetings around next steps. So um, that's kind of where we are. I'm just skimming those questions. I will say that the, the community solar, the solar that is going on there now is a really intense project. So Aaron Jock, myself, uh, our inspectors, the fire department, um, we, we are all out there keeping a very close eye on town land. As you know, it is a very high priority, pro uh, high visibility project for the town. It's also a high priority for the town. Um, it will bring in a significant amount of money uh, in a pilot, but we want to make sure the project is done right and done well and safeguards all the uh, sensitive ecological areas out there. 
So a lot of things happening out there. I, I, I guess I'm asking for everyone's patience. Um, we're going probably as fast and as furious as we can on Hickory Ridge among all the other projects we're managing. Happy to take any questions on it. Any questions? Pam? Hi, thanks. I'm really delighted to uh, hear that all the wetland and, and uh, environmental studies are being done there. It's such a beautiful piece of property. Um, one of the things that, that caught my attention was an email from, uh, I think was one of the co-chairs of the housing trust. And they sort of said, you know, we're hearing, we're hearing about, it's almost like fait accompli, um, proposals for use of Hickory Ridge um, as kind of a response to their question about housing and was there opportunity for housing at Hickory Ridge. And, and it, it keeps feeling like the, the cart coming before the horse, the comprehensive plan isn't done. And yet, you know, there are often all of these references to, well, that's probably, probably where the um, fire station will go. And yet we, you know, none of this is determined yet. Um, is there an issue with the the order of this, or I, you know, you're not trying to keep things secret. It's not like you're going to unveil a big plan in September. But um, um, well, I can answer that. Yeah, I, I think I think we are going to we are going to present a comprehensive plan in the fall. I didn't commit to September one or anything like that, but in the fall we are going to uh, present a comprehensive plan for the property, which will include many options. I think that's the key. Um, I will say that I, I did see some of those emails today. I thought they were actually unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and jumped to some conclusions that are there is no fait accompli. I do think the fire, to be perfectly honest, uh, Paul, myself, uh, frankly, the council, uh, it has been brought up multiple times at council meetings. In fact, it's been mentioned multiple times in, in local newspapers and, and the press that the possibility, a strong possibility exists that Hickory Ridge could be a compatible site for the fire station. So for folks to be surprised by that at this point, I think is, I don't know. I don't know where to go with that, but I will say that there, you know, it has not been decided that will be a decision that goes through multiple layers of, of decision making and, and consideration. And ultimately, um, if that is decided on the space, our job as town staff is to look at the feasibility. And that's why that massing study um, that we are engaged in is looking at, will a fire station fit on the available developable frontage? And I think the short answer is we believe it will, but it has not been decided that there will be a South Amherst fire station there. Um, so I'm, I'm committed to working with the housing trust. I haven't reached back out to the co-chairs yet, but I think some education and information for the, for the trust would be beneficial for them to understand what it means to do a plan with multiple options for for the, the the property. So nothing has been decided. Um, solar was predetermined when we bought the site. So that project is moving forward. I think there was broad community support. In fact, I would say the community support for public access and trails was probably the number one uh, use of the site. So that's why we went forward with the uh, trail grant. But other than that, there has been no major decisions on the outcome, particularly of the uh, frontage. Does that answer your question, Pam? Thank you. Dorothy? Um, well, I, I personally think that you have, at least to us in the council, communicated these possibilities. Uh, I think the problem is that the idea of the fire station has met a great need since we couldn't seem to find a place for the fire station that if that worked, that would be great, but it also the possibility of affordable senior housing has been very attractive at the same time. Um, and I guess we can't have the two of them on the same property. So um, because it's been in the air, you know, still under study and the housing thing was put out, some people just kind of, I think, latched on that. But 
um, I mean, we in the council know that we've got to find a place for the fire station. And um, I've certainly come to, to believe that where DPW is, is the best place for DPW to be, since it doesn't seem to bother anybody, and you can't even see it when you go by. So um, it's just one of those things. Uh, but I do, I do think that, you know, I was always aware of the two possibilities and that we didn't have it decided yet. So, um, you know, well, I don't guess I would, I would just kind of wrap by saying, I understand um, we've gone, kind of, we staff have kind of gone into a quiet phase of working with some of the consultants on some of the design for trails and massing studies and all of that. And I would just ask for your patience as we pull that all together again, you know, some months ago when this was all uh, launched, we also lost two of our planning staff. So we've been moving at a pace that we're comfortable with and can, can get done. But I understand people are kind of saying, well, what's happening with Hickory? I haven't heard much about it in a while. So I think what I'm saying is fall, mid fall would be a good time to say, okay, let's present to various boards and committees, including, including the Housing Trust, the, um, the council, perhaps CRC, others, and say, here's where we are. Here's what staff have accomplished. Nothing you know, has been decided about the fire station or the frontage, but now is the time to begin to um, re-engage with the boards and committees, the council and the community. And we did promise that, we, we did promise. I, I just, um, we've gone into a, a little bit of a, a darker phase, if you will, of, of uh, gathering information and getting those plans all together. I will say that um, I met with the solar company recently and they would like to do some walkabouts and take people to the edge from, from the old clubhouse to the edge of the solar project and talk a little bit about where they are. So I'm working with Aaron Jock to schedule those. And we do a series of them, maybe three or four of them, where council members, committee members, community members could come with us. And it'll be kind of a nature walk, but also a chance to see the solar going in up close. We will not be in the construction area, but it'll also be a chance for anyone on this call and the community to ask AMP and their team questions about the project. Um, and right now, where they are, they're doing road construction, they're doing fence, uh, they're erecting fences, and then uh, the solar panels would be some couple of months away before they even came in. But I think that would be a great opportunity for the public to kind of get out there and meet with staff from the town, as well as uh, the team that is installing the solar. So I understand, and I think, uh, you know, mid-fall, Paul and I can plan for some presentations in uh, the, the mid part of the, the fall of this year. Andy? Yeah, I just uh, want to take chair responsibility of urging that we move on to fire as soon as we can uh, because it is getting late. And I appreciate all of the time from conservation development that you've provided, but I um, wonder if we uh, need to move on so we can get to our last sections of our meeting. Sure. Any, I guess, any final questions? Is there, um, I guess if there are final questions, you can email them uh, to Andy or I, and we can um, get them out to department heads for answers. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you, Chris and Rob, as well. Thank you. All right, Chief Nelson, showtime. Do you want to? Oh, 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 <laughs> do you want to? Um, Say anything to begin, or do you want to hop right? No, questions? just you know, you know, why, why don't we just just uh, just just roll with it and, and get and get right right into the into the core questions oh. and the, and the, anything we might want 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 to add will come come out in, in the course of conversation. Okay, give me All one right. second just to find the fire questions. All right. Um. So have you? Um, Before you. I guess we'll, Sorry, Go on. I just want to note that Alicia is no longer connected. Okay. Three, four, five, six. We still have seven counselors. Good. Okay. Um, Chief Nelson, can you discuss yep. the impacts of UMass extending their term into late May? And have you seen um, uh, uh, impact on the, your volume of calls? 
Well, you know, we've we've only only got a really short one when window to compare pair to you know from the last, last say five 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 years or whatever uh in these additional two 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 weeks uh two two week, weeks ago there's only a six six a six six call in in increase and last last week it was says 17 calls more than a year pre, pre previous for the same period, period period i would beg to say that uh that came about because because of weather Two two weeks ago we had a pretty crack crack or crappy week. Last last week was a bit better weather wise. We had more folks out out and about and that and that type type of thing. So we didn't dig dig down into into what type of calls were more and this and that. But in gen, general, it's a very small in 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 increase. Uh, our main concern was uh, the additional, I think three 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 to four week weekends. You know uh, that we thought we'd see an, an, an increase in calls, and what, and so we uh, we 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 put on it additional staff Friday, Friday for Friday and Saturday, Saturday, Saturday nights, uh, and during during the day on Saturday during you know the yeah the afternoons on the Saturday, Saturday, Saturdays. I mean, there's a slight in in increase in in, in activity as you might expect on a weekend. Uh, it, Typically, it was what weather driven, but at the same same time, we covered all the calls because uh, we we added we 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 went at added with a 12, 12 person staff on 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 shift, and that and that and, and that made 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 the difference. So, um, Chief Nelson, is yeah. Cress impacting your operations in any way? Not not re really. I mean, you know. We we interact act with 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 them. We support support them and that type type of thing. But right now, you know, it's not it's not any emergency res. They're not re -re responding to emer emergencies that that we that we we go go to or the type where they're going to call 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 us to 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 respond. They're not they're not at at that that point point yet. So I mean, we've 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 made, you know we've we've gone gone to calls and made uh, refer referrals to to them to to assist assist with some you know with with an individual or some something like that, but this but it's not really it hasn't it hasn't changed or um, amended our our, our, our our operation yet. So um, next question is about service levels. Um, do the levels that are in the in the chart do they include responses to Leverett, Pelham, and Shootsbury? Yes. Okay. You can see, and, and we break break it down on our. We have a one page page, page that we do each each year that that would break that's a, break that break that, that, that down. Yeah. Great. Um, fire rescue calls have significantly increased since FY eighteen. Yep. Um, I think we talked a little bit about this last year as well. But yeah, we did. Uh, can, yeah, can we you, did. Can you expand upon uh, the yeah. reason for that? It's pretty much you know the same same thing, and I'll have. Uh, uh, I th I'm not sure if Jeff, Jeff is still on. Uh, I think he jumped off. Yeah, he's a, he's at a seminar. So, uh, but, you know, but excuse me, Jesus. Again, it, it's same 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 thing. Uh, one one of the reasons, a couple a couple of reasons. Uh, we went to um, uh, pair 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 paramedic equipped and engines. Uh, six seven years year, years ago, so that so that's the one one of the in the in the the, the increase increases. So we're do, doing more more there. One of the the other the, the other the other thing thing is is that we're sent there. We've we've come up come up with uh, a slate of um, high, higher Q Q Q D calls where you where 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 we send an ambulance and and a uh, an engine uh, company and there is there have been studies studies done that show that the uh, that the the out, out the outcomes are better, better more 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 hands you have have on scene uh, some some sometimes it it's about move, moving a patient yeah uh, from from a carrier's position or a difficult lift because of the weight of the patient and sometimes it's you know trying trying to nav nav navigate a stair stairway or something something like that uh, and the more more hands you know uh, the more the more more work, work is spread the more weight weight is spread the more stress stress is spread spread out over over many folks one 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 back in, in injury can 
can cost cost the town thousands and thousands, thousands, thousands of dollars. So that's so that's a, that's a that's a, that that's one another big big reason. But the the main re reason is that we see better out 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 outcomes for for the pay, patients. You know, you have most of our personnel are med or medics. So eyes more eyes and. I guess experience that you get to get on 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 scene again. You have more there. There is more help. There's more assistance. But you know, some some someone is going to see, see see something that some someone else might. So so we we found found that that uh, that, that that it make it make it makes a big 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 difference. It really, it really does. And I think what we discussed last year is it's it's not an increase in calls, but it's an increase in the level of service provided. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, which is why sure. I, I mean, yeah, here. and that's and and that's you know we're we're not we're you know we're we're not about calls. We we're 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 about providing providing service service right. as, as as you said. Yeah. So. So the next question is about um, patient contacts, and I, I'm again sure Jeff would have been um, had this answer at the top uh, tip of his tongue but um there's been an yeah, increase we, well, we, in we, the... we got a, we have it all he that i had him okay, uh, send, send, send 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 me his his uh his his, his tree, treatise on, on this and plus i had okay. a one of one of our cat 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 captains do do a deep deep Perfect. dive on all on all all this so it's and and you know what what you just sent pretty pretty much supports what what the captain's out of the valley sent so and uh, uh, so around the uh, increase in um treat no transports have gone up significantly since FY18. Yeah, and part 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 of that is uh one we changed our uh, our our reporting saw 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 software and that's and this came came up last last year I believe. We changed our reporting software and the new saw saw software is better but it reports things the differently it counts different things as 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 no as uh, patient contacts and that and that type type and that type type of thing you know there and one of the other things is we are you know we're becoming becoming a, young, a younger department and what what you'll find is uh season season you know med, 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 uh, medics will they 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 may go they may go go to a call where they treat a pay pay a patient, and but but it does it does, that doesn't warrant a tran 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 transport, and but and they'll mark mark it down as a no no no, no tran transport. With our with our, our new newer um, medics come come coming in, the trend is to to uh, log the fact that you did treat, but you didn't tran tran transport. So that's that's part part that's part of it as well, you know. So I mean, we I mean we're 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 still pretty much trying to transport reporting the same the same percentage that that we have over 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 over, over time. We're trying to transporting anywhere between seventy six and seventy four percent of our con, con contacts. So that so that's still still ha ha happening. So, and I and I think the committee you'll notice this in a lots of departments as we modernize our data collection systems um sometimes there's these little hiccups but they'll eventually even out yeah. i think we've seen this in lots of places where um yeah we're sort of in this transition period of collecting things yeah. one way and right. moving to different different ways of doing right. it one of the good one of the nice nice things about the transition is that we've got a lot more in in, in information that delve delve in in in, in, in to. It really gives me, we can get a really comprehensive look at what 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 we're doing, how and how how well we're doing. Yep. Dorothy. I'm not sure if I if I I I got that a change in software has things been counted differently. Mm -hmm. but, um I thought that I heard at the CCC meeting at, at UMass that there had been an increase of transfers in the last couple of years uh, from our fire department, from Hadley Fire Department, and well, all. Yeah. Of, so, uh, well, yeah. Well, so our model... saying there wasn't really an increase; it was a software change. No, we're no. I was talking, talking about this one particular piece. Overall, okay. uh, actually, our vol, vol volume has 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 gone 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 up. It's gone 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 up all over. Per se, but the thing, but um, so our, our vol, vol volume has gone up, but we still tran, 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 transport the same percent of the percentage of people. Oh, I so, got it. Thank okay. you. Okay, sure. Yes. No problem. Thank you no very problem. Much. Okay. 
So the last uh, formal question is around mutual aid and ambulances um, uh, going out of Amherst significantly increasing since FY18. I know you and I mm -hmm. have discussed this a little bit. Can you talk about the yeah. trends and mutual aid? The trends are uh, pretty much folks are ca catching up to to us. In the past, we uh, we we received uh, I, what I what I what I've characterized the dis as a dis dis disproportionate amount of uh, mutual aid in 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 the, in the, in the town. And I, and you can and it's just that we we've we've been you know, tradition tra traditionally a high vol 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 volume service service. And because our staff, staffing level level levels traditionally, I'm, I'm talking going back at least 30 years, the past 30 years, did not match the vol 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 volume. Now that's now that's changed changed a bit. We we've added more more positions, but now we're up against the fact that you can't find qual qual quality people to fill fill those positions, and that's just the way way it is all around, actually around around the world. So. So there, there's been a shift, in, and other, and other cities and towns are experiencing the same thing. Their vol, 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 volumes have gone, 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 gone up quite, quite a bit. So they're looking for help more, more, you know, even, even more. There's another little quirk in in in, in that as well. Uh, state law changed so that uh, we, if 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 we used we used used to be, be, be able to hold back. Our last AM and our last staffed ambulance that and that and that and that was fine, but now the law changed last year in saying that if you have a staffed ambulance and you and and mutual aid is re required requested, we have to send out our last our last AM, 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 ambulance. So, so that so that's that's going to add to our, our our mutual aid out. So, uh, you know, again, there's it's just been a shift, you know, a shift over, over time. You know, whereas we 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 were requiring requiring more and more in, now now there's been been a shift and we're since send, send, sending more out. So, Andy, yeah, Chief, uh, I was uh, I saw that uh, one of the challenges you were facing was uh, call staff, and I was wondering if you could say anything about how you're utilizing and relying on. Paul staff uh, and student uh, staff, whether that is getting to be a challenge to the point where you're going to have to think about uh, how the department is structured differently. Well, we will. Uh, we'll have we'll have to think think about that. But I, I but Lin, 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 that's Lin, Lin, Lindsay's bail 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 bailiwick. So I'll shift shift to the, to him. Sure. Um, yeah, we are concerned about what I'll call the health of our uh, call force. Um, through various, you know, dynamics, things outside influences on the department that are going on regionally, not just to us. As the chief already mentioned, full time, we're facing the situation right now where we have uh, many, a number of open vacancies. We have hired four new people, which will be starting in June. That still leaves us chief with, I think, what, up to four more vacancies. Yep, we're still we're still still four 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 short. Four short. Yeah. So, and that's because of a regional shortage, as the chief said, with uh, paramedics and EMTs. So our full-time force, we're seeing that. Um, our student force, by contrast, our UMass student volunteers were fully staffed. And that's mainly because we have a fresh crop coming in every semester, right? You know, we get uh, thousands and thousands of more students coming to this university every semester. We're able to keep the student force up and running. So that's held on very well. The call force, which is our part-time firefighters, town residents, people that work in town, um, again, following a national trend is extremely hard to get people to commit to being a call firefighter these days. Again, that's a national problem, not just here. So our call force right now is uh, at a 50% strength. We should have 20 to 24. We have about 10 to 12 active. Uh, we tried to hire some more last year. We were willing to take as many as 10. We end up with four ultimately being hired. So it is definitely a concern. Um, our, our student force, if you will, carries most of our coverage load during the school year. And by that, I mean when the full-time firefighters are tied up, mostly on ambulance calls. Uh, the student force is here every night during the week, seven days a week, and 24 hours on the weekends. So they become the next in line. They are our coverage company. The call force handles the daytimes, weekdays, but we don't have a lot of act as much activity then. Uh, during the summer, which we're starting now this weekend, 
through August and also in January, there is no student force. Our call force carries that coverage load. And it is definitely a concern as to their ongoing ability to do that. We've discussed um, hiring, recruiting, uh, things that we can do for that. We have a proposal out to raise their wages. We did a comparison of uh, our call force wages. They're paid hourly when they're called in and for training. Uh, to neighboring communities, Leverett, Shutesbury, uh, Hadley, Pelham, Belchertown, and we're actually the lowest. So we've made a proposal to try to bring that up, that hourly rate up to make it a little bit more attractive. I think that needs to be done. I do not think that will solve the problem. So short answer to your question is yes, we are concerned about the ongoing viability of that group. We want to see it continue. Um, if not, I'm not sure where we go with that, honestly, as a department. Mm -hmm. Um, I noticed that Hadley just went through um, approving actually some small force that they're adding to their um, group that they already have that are in Hadley. Mm -hmm. And the impression I got, at least from the newspaper article, was they were doing this so that they didn't have to rely on mutual aid as much. Do you see that impacting our relationship with Hadley, which of course changed dramatically when they went to their own, uh, for your own contracted group? I, I don't think, think it's gonna, gonna change change thing, thing, things much because they're not adding to their their ambulance service, service, and that, and that's where that's where pretty much most of our mutual aid goes. It's it's not it's not it's not fire fire. It's it's an ambulance, and they're not adding more more uh, more ambulance crews. So we're, I would think we're, we're going to still we're going to see the same rate of of a response to Hadley for mutual aid EMS. So okay, thank you. Sure, Jennifer. Yeah, I just, um, my question, I, I don't know if it uh, makes sense, but like when they built, opened a new building, like the Fieldstone Complex, those two dorms that are opening on Mass Ave and Lincoln, yep. they're huge oh. buildings and there'll be 800 residents. Does that, yep. will that measurably, could it impact? I mean, is that something that you prepare for? Or you anticipate that? Sure. You know, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, well, we, yeah, the easy answer is that you know, as, you know, as that, as that, as that's how proper proper property grows and adds more and more people, it's you know, it's a small, small, small city. We we should 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 add a proportionate amount of per personnel to, to you know, to 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 respond because 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 of the growth. The thing one of and and we pre pre prepare we study we're we're in we're in we're in on on the ground 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 floor for you know no no pun pun, pun intended attended when they when when they build build that our our, our prevent prevention bureau bureau is great 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 at that stay staying abreast breast breast of of the build, building that uh, that go go goes on and why as it progresses and we and and we we're, we're I guess you say we're intimately in, 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 in involved with all with, with all with all build, the building that happens in uh, at U U Mass, which is a good good thing. We have a good really relationship there. One of the nice nice things is that um, all their build buildings are sprinkled. Spring, spring that's a great that's a good good thing. But at the same time, as you add more people, and it's just a fun function of adding more people. People, you're going to get more calls, and that's just just the way way it is. You're going to get more, more, more alarms. You're going to get more folks that are going to trip and fall. You're going to get more car accidents. You're going to get more things that are going to be a cause for us to 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 to, to respond. And it's not because it's UMass; it's just because there's just more people, and that and that and that and that is the key. Matt. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, Chief, thanks so much for um, this presentation and for all, all that you guys do. Um, so, and this might be more of a Sean and Paul question than a um, Fire Chief question, but I've just wanted to sort of uh, open up the discussion a little bit on the um, plan to transition the four new uh, positions over into future budgets. And then also, as I understand it, we, the ladder truck is borrowed and we've begun paying on debt 
for the ladder truck. And there's one more pumper that's being borrowed this year and another pumper in a couple of years. Is that is that accurate? Can you just correct me? Yeah. So um, the ladder truck has the funding has been approved. We haven't started repaying it because vehicles are taking uh, multiple years to get. So, the, um, Lindsay, do you have an update on when we might actually see the ladder truck? Yeah, the ladder truck we're looking at June of 24. So just over a year from now. Yeah, and that's the problem we're seeing with vehicles is when we bring it to you, um, it's probably another two years from when we bring it, to, when I say you, <laughs> meaning the council, um, uh, by the time it actually arrives. So so the debt will start after we receive it. Um, and same thing with the pumper truck. So there was um, a pumper truck approved maybe last year. And Lindsay, do you have an update on that one? Yeah, um, it starts to get blurry with the FYs, but um, I think FY22, we approved the, the money for a pumper that was supposed to be delivered this coming September. It's now been pushed back to February of 24, so it's crazy. Right. Um, we're over yep. two years yep. on some of these, but again, that's national. Um, and then in this year's capital budget, right, we have um, a pumper which would take another two years to, uh, before it's delivered and we start paying on. And that right. one's already, you remember what year that one is that we're, we brought forward this year, the, the age of that one? Yeah, the one that's being replaced first is the 1999 and the next one is a 2001. Right, so by the time we get it, it'll be 24, 25 years old, potentially. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, yep. and, I, and I think I've said to this uh, Chief Nelson and um, Lindsay that, there was sort of this wave of new vehicles or wave of heavy equipment that we bought in the late 90s, early 2000s, and that that wave has sort of come back around for replacement. Dorothy? Oh, yeah. Or Matt, sorry, did you have any follow-up questions? Yeah, you, had, you had another piece of that? Firefighters. Just speak to the firefighters briefly, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we have funding through ARPA, um, and we've been using ARPA to pay them. Um, our plan is to transition them sooner rather than later into the operating budget um, and the hope is we'll be coming back to the council in the near future um, to, to kind of elaborate more on that plan of, of how we would do that but future wise say it again sorry uh, not in FY24 uh, potentially I think that'll be part of the conversation okay but it'll be from um, I don't want to spoil the surprise, so we'll talk about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. it. It should be in the near future. Okay, I will stay tuned. Thank you. Dorothy? Okay, I just have to take the opportunity to uh, thank the uh, EMTs. Uh, they did come from my husband sometime this spring, and um, he was having a symptom that uh, really scared him. And the minute they got here, it was just so professional, so smooth, so wonderful. And when he was telling a friend about that, he'd had a, a, a more serious call recently and had the same response, absolutely the top of professionalism and, and friendly and warm. So it was, it was really, really great. So I just wanted to, feel, to say that whatever you're doing, whatever your problems, you're doing a great job. So thank you. Well, well thanks. Well, we appreciate that. I'll kind of pass that along. I mean, for us, that is the norm. We hire good people. And, and I said, I've said said it many, many times. We have we have we have great great training. We have great 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 equipment. But the key is, you know, we have all this whiz, whiz bang stuff. But the key is, we take care of people. And first and foremost, it's that 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 is our charge is taking care of people, doing what we can. Some sometimes, you know, it's a case case where some someone just needs a from 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 friendly face, you know, because at the because. You know, at at times we 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 might be the best part of some 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 someone's day. You know, so one of the, one of the things that we encourage is that when folks when our folks run run into a a case that's not even emergent, but it's just someone you know just just wants to wants to see see a friend 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 friendly face, they take the time to just kind of you know just uh, spend spend a little, a little time and be be human. You know, and that and we hire. Those kind kind of people we demand. We, that's one of the things thing, things we demand. I mean, we we have. I've, I've been uh, 
uh, chat chat size at times uh, in meetings and all that. But I've I've said from day one, we are the pre preeminent fire re re rescue e e e EMS department in 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 the valley the valley. And I'll, and I and they say it ain't it ain't bragging if you can back back it up. And we back back it up every day. Lynn? And my family adds your thanks as well for coming up the driveway twice in the last couple of months. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Bob? I want to echo the thanks. Um, my wife was involved in a very serious car accident in early March, and the EMTs were kind and professional and helped her out a lot. So thanks. Good. Thank you. Good. I don't know. How's she, how's she, she, she doing? She's doing okay. I mean, yeah. she's recovering. It's yeah. uh, it's it's been a, it's been. A, I, I wouldn't say that it was the best day part of her day. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, she's doing she's doing well, and she's okay. she'll be fine. One day at a time. One day at a time. Yep. Okay. Good. Good. Good to hear. Are there any other fire uh, questions for fire EMS? All right. Well, thank you both for um, hanging with us for the past no. hour and a half and um, no help answering those questions and really no appreciate problem. your time. All right. Be good. Yeah, I also want to thank you for all you do every day. Thank I'll you. pass that, that along. I'll pass, uh, pass along. Thanks. Appreciate it. Take care. Take care. You, you too. All righty. So um, I'm going to be at this point very quick because I know it's getting late and I but I and so I would want to conclude the rest of the meeting as quickly as possible and get us Andy we, we have one we have one more department um public health that I oh, think we can go right. through, I think we can go through it quickly Jen Brown is not able to attend there were a couple of questions that I can respond to um and Paul uh will will answer any other questions is it okay if I go through it quickly yes go ahead um Okay, so the two questions that came in for public health, um, I think these were from Matt. Um, one was, is it accurate that we are looking at a $26,871 increase in personnel costs um, that reflect increased salary for the public health nurse? How much of this is additional part-time staffing? Um, and so just to clarify, so there was a um, one of the areas that, were in, that this budget proposal added to was public health. Um, it's not all an increase for the health nurse, though. It's um, There was a $20,000 increase in the um, extra helpline. Um, and the background around that was uh, the previous kind of organization for public health was the director worked a part-time schedule. Um, there was a full-time public health nurse and um, because the director worked a part-time health schedule or part-time schedule, there was funding there to fund extra help. And so there's been extra help in the health department from that and, and that way. Um, through the pandemic and transition health directors, we increased the public health director to full-time um, and kept the full-time public health nurse. Um, and but we still needed a funding source now for the extra help. And so uh, this $20,000 increase essentially funds something that's been going on, but um, was sort of uh, covered a different way. And then the other piece, um, uh, the other piece of the increase to public health relates to the mosquito control program. Um, the council had to make a decision a couple of years ago how to participate in mosquito control, or it would have to sort of accept um, spraying. Um, and so we opted into a regional program that has a $5,000 annual assessment. Um, it was unclear. Uh, we didn't budget it for FY23 because the timing was unclear, um, but we are proposing it in the FY24 budget as a, a new recurring item. Um, uh, and there's no, there's no state reimbursement for it, unfortunately. Um, and so, yeah, those are the two, two questions. Anybody else have questions for Sean or Paul about public health? Bob? Bob? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't know whether this is, well, anyway, we have a serious problem among our teenagers, especially adolescent girls, with uh, social media um, and other kinds of issues that are, you know, causing them great harm. And I'm wondering whether the town is involved at all with you know, dealing with this crisis or whether this is, you know, kind of something that the school, the school system is dealing with. In other words, is, is our, is our 
public health department dealing with this at all? Yeah, I'm not aware of the public health department working on this. The schools certainly are. This has not mm -hmm. been, I don't think this has shown up on the radar screen for the health department though, but I understand what you're saying. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And I'm in favor of the ban uh, until you're 18 as a father of three, three girls. Uh, so, Dorothy. So on the mosquitoes, if you let the state, if you, if we did spraying, would that be free? Would the state pay uh, for it? That's a good question. I don't know um, if they would pay for it or if they would still assess us, but I think, um, I mean, the, co the council may re remember the conversation better than I, but I think there was a, um, sort of uh, objection to sort of the spraying, aerial spraying of, for mosquitoes and, and worry that it might not land yeah. where you want it to land. So the issue was whether the town controls what happens within its borders or if the state is going to control what happens within its borders. And so that as we went through this, we had a lot of advocacy from people who did not want spraying in the town unless it was really an egregious situation. And there was not confidence in the state that they would you know, follow the same kind of values that the town had. Mm -hmm. So joining the regional group, which many local areas, towns are, are involved with seemed to be the right path. You know, I, I agree in not having the, the mass aerial spraying, but I just seemed unfair of the state is what I'm getting at. Yeah, and what we get now is, uh, you know, we get a report, I mean, we get serv a variety of services, but one thing we get now is a testing program where they do different types of testing of mosquitoes throughout the year to see if there's any type of, um, viruses that are concerning, and then we would be notified. And th this has been an issue that Senator Comerford has taken on as well, so she's pretty knee deep into this stuff as well. Thank you. Any other public health questions? I'll just give a plug. We do have a translation service now. Um, one of the ARPA funded initiatives was for a uh, public health specific translation program. Um, so if anyone calls with um, speaking different language that needs the translations, they have a at their sort of fingertips a, um, a way to access um, a variety of different languages. Um, and then there are some additional staffing that you don't see in the general fund budget that ARPA is continuing to support related to the pandemic. And um, that'll be something that we uh, wind down over the next year or so. All right, Andy, mm -hmm. I guess I'll turn it back to you. Okay, so uh, as far as the process is concerned, we're not really going to get into the discussion tonight, given the hour of um, how, how we're proceeding now to make decisions on the budget as a finance committee. So um, the next meeting on Friday will be finance committee only. Uh, what we first will have to do is to decide um, whether there are sections of the budget where any members wish to raise questions um, and with the assumption that if there are no questions to be raised um, and uh, that we're probably in a uh, mode where that for that section of the budget, um, there's going to be agreement across the board to just um, accept that and uh, section of the budget um, or to at least identify areas that need to comment. And the one that I was working on is one where we know we're going to have to discuss it. Um, and that's uh, edu uh, education, public schools, and the elementary school because of the request from the uh, school committee which was the unanimous request to us. So that is one. Um, so what I'm going to be doing at the next meeting, and I'm going to send an email out uh, tomorrow to the committee in which I'll describe all of this so that Alicia is aware of this too, is uh, to suggest that um, if there's a request for any other topics that need um, individual discussion for any reason, to just let me know so that I can schedule it um, appropriately for the meeting. And um, then that'll enable us to have discussion of each section that needs discussion. And if it um, ends up that there's a motion that gets made at the end of those particular discussions um, or more than one motion will um, of course, deal with those motions one at a time, which will then enable us to 
um, see if we've arrived at a uh, agreed position in the finance committee on um, what our recommendation is going to be on the budget, which then turns us into um, making sure that we get the draft written uh, and uh, on and, and to get it to the council um, with the deadline in mind, um, knowing what happened last year, we were delayed a little bit, but we'll, I, I'll, you know, at least we'll, I'm going to make a proposal that we can discuss also fairly early on Friday as far as, uh, because it'll, you'll be able to see it and think about it, but if we're going to uh, make the deadline uh, for the complete report, I would really need to get drafts of all sections by the 26th or 27th, um, um, no later than the 27th, and uh, so that we can uh, get a master draft put together um, and uh, then um, get it to all of you on the 29th so that we have a meeting scheduled if we, um, on the 30th uh, that we can uh, discuss the draft as it's been put together and make any changes that need to be made and get it out on the 31st, which is actually the deadline day for the, um, if we're going to adhere to the 30 days. So that's a uh, fairly ambitious uh, plan. Uh, if necessary, we're going to have to uh, leave some sections to be written after the fact with just um, a notation within the report. But we do need to, by the uh, charter, get a report out. So uh, that's uh, pretty much what I was going to. But out there, I think the other thing that I just wanted to let you know is, is that, um, you know, we do recognize, we are going to have to recognize that there's going to be variance among sections. We'll explain that to um, the council in the report that different sections were written by different people and we did not make an attempt to have them all be uniform. I think that it, it really is going to depend upon who's writing the report and the uh, nature of the area. And uh, I did do the school's draft, first draft, which I can, can't complete because we haven't had the discussion on it. Uh, but right now it's running at about two pages and I don't think it's gonna run too much longer. I think that that's actually, I'm thinking one of the, the longer ones that we're gonna have because it's dealing with a lot of material it's not within the budget book that the, that the council has. So there was less ability to make direct reference. I could only do it by including a link and uh, there's some comp complex material in it. Um, so I don't think that they're um, all need to be that long, uh, but I just wanted to give you a sense of where I was at. I decided that I didn't want to send it out um, this early because it, it would throw things off. So are there any comments about what I just said or questions um, about the process that we're going through as far as our next stage? Uh, so if there aren't any, then as I said, I will do that. And the other thing that I was going to do is I, I did, um, Athena had asked me about um, three sets of minutes that was on the agenda for a previous meeting earlier in the month. And uh, now in the minutes that she was talking about were um, December 6th, January 10th, and January 24th. And um, I'm going to try, and, and I asked her to go ahead and put them back in the packet for the 26th and uh, to um, get them on the agenda and the packet done. And um, I'm gonna make an effort to let you know if I spot anything in advance this time and uh, see if we can get them done. If not, we'll push them up to the 30th. Paul, you had a 
Yeah, I, I just want to note that I will not be at the meeting on Friday. I assume Sean is going to be in town that day. So just so you know. Yes, well, I, I gathered that from uh, the fact that you uh, appointed somebody to be the acting you. Uh, anything else that uh, anyone wants to discuss today? Because uh, I know it's getting late, and that's why I'm trying to close this up as quickly as possible. And I have no an, an unanticipated business, and I will assume, barring a hand going up, that nobody else has unanticipated business. So um, I will get that uh, memo off to you. If you have any comments about the process, um, when I get that memo off to you, uh, which I will try and do first thing tomorrow, um, then don't hesitate to get back to me uh, about it. And uh, we'll uh, make our best effort. I thank everybody for what they're doing. And uh, I guess we're adjourned. All right.